so, hi everyone. Um, like I said, uh, my name is Henrik Örqvist. Um, I'm sort of a new guy on the block. Uh, I ha haven't got nearly the same amount of experience as Matthias from Remedy or, or Tobias that recently spoke here. Um, I'm sort of you guys in a couple of years, hopefully, or m some of you guys anyway. Uh, and I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, our move, uh, the little team that I'm in called Silent Grove Studios, the move we've made from hobby developers into what we are now, basically a startup developer trying to launch our first title. So, like I said, um, my name is Henrik, uh, producer and lead game designer, heavy titles uh, in not such a heavy team, so it doesn't really have the oomph it's supposed to have. Um, I thought I'd start off a little bit, um, just a quickie about myself. Uh, I have no previous experience uh, in the games industry, um, and I've worked with web development before uh, for like eight or nine years or so as a graphic designer. Um, so a while back, uh, we started up our company, uh, which is called Silent Grove Studios, and it's based outside of Stockholm in Sweden. Um, we're five people working on the team. Uh, we've got one programmer, one character modeler, animator, one level designer, one audio guy, and me. Um, I'm sort of doing the business side of the things and some texture work. I do the particle effects of the game, and I'm mainly responsible for the game design. Um, although, in such a small team, everybody pitches in. Uh, it looks fairly rigid uh, right there. You know, everybody have, has their sort of areas which in they work. Um, but in such a small team, everybody is doing what it was necessary. Um, uh, how many of you, first off, uh, are sort of looking into, you know, starting up your own project or being in a mod team or whatever, basically? Okay, so there's, there's a few of you going down, down that route. Um, I can tell you uh, that um, it's not the best way to get into the industry, starting up your own company. It's a very harsh way. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a few seconds. The company was founded in May. That's a couple of months ago uh, when we began full-time production. Um, but we have been at it since 2000. Um, we started out um, basically just a bunch of guys, friends, colleagues, whatnot, that wanted to make games. And we had a, a specific game we wanted to make. We were playing a lot of X-Wing Alliance. Uh, for those of you who don't know the game, uh, it's a Star Wars-based game. It's a space sim. You fly around, you dogfight in space, and it, it, it's just monstrous loads of fun. And we thought the graphics was getting old. We wanted to do it, you know, better looking, hipper, cooler. Uh, so that was our first title. And we sat down. I think we were about six or seven people at the time. Um, and we sat down, and this is what we wanted to do. Uh, after a few months, we realized, hey, we might actually be pretty good at this. Uh, we were getting the team along and everything. So we so thought, you know, OK, um, let's go business on this. Uh, can, we, can we make a living on it? Um, and we started doing some research. And we thought about, oh, all right, what other games are under development? Uh, what's coming? You know, what's happened to the whole space sim genre? And we found out. It was fading. I don't know if you've heard of a successful space sim in a few years. Uh, at the time, Microsoft uh, released Allegiance, um, which was just one of the biggest flunks in their history, I think. Uh, so it, it was such a big flop that Microsoft, of all companies, gave the source code to the community. There's a few players who really loved the game, but you know they couldn't make any money of it, so they just gave it away. Uh, this was a problem for us, naturally. Uh, we want, did, didn't want to be first-time developers uh, going into a genre that was dying. Uh, so we sat down. We talked about what, what sort of genre and game and setting and everything do we enjoy? Wh what do we want to do? Um, and we sat down and figured out that most of us like strategy games and RPGs in a fantasy setting. So OK, that's a, a genre and, and, and a niche that's never going to fade, basically. Everybody loves it. Uh, so we so thought, OK, let's go fantasy. Um, we then sat down uh, and started looking at what type of game did we want to make. 
And that game, Dawn Spire, was born in the end of 2002. And the first draft um, of the game was fairly ambitious, you might say. Um, it was supposed to have an epic storyline, think Baldur's Gate 2 or whatever, uh, gigantic world generated procedurally. It was supposed to have custom-made parts of this world, cities, and etc., that was supposed to seamlessly blend into that procedurally generated terrain. Uh, we were supposed to generate this world every time you started a new game, so you had ver variation on everything. Uh, no loading times, <sighs> single player and cooperative gameplay. We wanted the qu a dynamic quest engine which wrote the quests on the fly, so you know you had new quests and new rewards and everything every time you played the game. Full guild support, we wanted to ma let people build fortresses and stu stuff like that. Uh, and challenge each other in this world. Um, interesting PvP modes to complement that. Um, and, you know, five people doing it. Uh, yeah, insanity, madness, it's, it's just broken. It's uh, and so, what we did, we didn't think at the time that this was impossible. We thought, like I've heard a zillion times since that time, you know, we can do it. I want to make an MMO, you can do everything in this, and blah, blah, blah. And somebody's going to pull it off eventually, but um, at the time, we were one of those guys. We thought, you know, it's going to be hard, but doable. Um, so our first plan, it was to create a small portion of the game, uh, a little village called Miriam, uh, that was supposed to be fully feature complete. Um, and we were then going to sort of use that demo level, that little niche of the game, um, to publish, uh, to get a publishing deal with a, a you know, publisher, just call up EA and say, hey, we got this demo right here, uh, give us a few millions and we'll do the game. Um, about two years later, um, that village wasn't co near completion and the features just weren't there at all. Um, so we sat there, you know, we had progress. It was taking shape, but it was oh so slowly and so painful. Um, my girlfriend still hates the game industry. Uh, I think that goes for the same, you know, of every team member. Um, but we scrutinized ourselves um, and said, you know, what can we do? Uh, what can we really complete of all this? We scrapped all but two of the main features that I recently announced here. Uh, we had more features as well, naturally. Uh, that was just the main ones. Uh, and we scrapped all of them except interesting PvP modes and guild support. That was sort of what we kept of this. The cooperative game played, epic storyline, the procedural terrain, <laughs> dead gone, doesn't exist, never has. Um, and we spent two years, basically, just, you know, okay, we can't do this, we have to, sh you know, we have to kill it, we have to scrap this, scrap this, okay, we can't. Like Tobias said earlier, pretty much, if for, for those of you who s had sat through that presentation. Um, so after two years of cutting features, uh, we were sort of adding to the game again. We were sort of looking, okay, we have these two features, which when you compare it to the other ones, it sounds like a pretty uninteresting, dull game, but it's not. Y you can dive into those features and produce whatever. Basically, that's Battlefield 2, right there. So you can produce a magic game with just that. Um, and what have we learned <laughs> during this process? And this is hopefully something um, that, like I said, we don't have a lot of experience that I can, you know, impart my wisdom upon you. But I hopefully have a few years of just dunking my head in the wall and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, in a small team, doing it on a hobby basis, trying to make it as a living. Um, first off, it takes an enormous, monstrous, gigantic, gargantuan proportion of time to make a game. This sounds ridiculous, it sounds obvious, but you can't really experience it until you've been through all these years. I mean, it's thousands of days and tens of thousands of man days, or man months, or whatever you want to you know, count it. We've been at it for so long, I can't even remember how my life was like not going home and watching our project site and see if anything happened. Um, I thought I'd show you a little slideshow as well to demonstrate this. This is Dawnspire.
two min months into development. We have a little editor. Um, you could put objects in it and rotate it, and rotate them 45 degrees. Um, that's it, basically, two months. Five months, we have a non-textured, non-animated character floating around. You can move it around and it just flows over the battlefield. Um, after eight months, we still, we have an untextured character due to our, our team not being really savvy at it, um, that could, by pressing left control, you could trigger an animation. He swung his sword. Amazing stuff, and we were thought, yeah, whoa, we're getting somewhere. Uh, all of this uh, sort of, um, you can see on the lo lower part of the screen there, the, the editor was sort of taking form. You could place objects, you could place sound emitters, um, and creatures. Uh, in the game. They couldn't really do anything yet, but the, the tools were taking form. Um, one year and three months into it, we were adding a lot more content. The village was sort of taking form. We had all the boats and stuff. We couldn't really do anything in the game still. Um, one year and five months later, this is an amazing screenshot. This was the first time when we thought, we have a game. You can play this game. Um, we have two abilities on this guy. Uh, an extra attack that does a little extra damage, and a heal that gives some little health. And you can see a hideous interface, courtesy of me, uh, on the bottom. Uh, one year and 11 months into it, um, we started to, make to be able to make bull shots for the first time. Sort of screenshot bull bullshit reference there. Uh, our level designer could rig interesting meshes up so it looked like sort of a good game at the time. We thought this screenshot was just, wow, it looks amazing. Uh, still couldn't really do it, anything in it. You couldn't play. One year and 11 months into it, almost two years. Two years and five months into the game, this is, now it's taken form. We have a rough version of Capture the Flag. Uh, all the abilities of three of the four playable classes are in, in rough shape. We have a little mini-map, we have a little interface going on, um, and you could play sort of that Capture the Flag thing. It was hilarious for us that and this is sort of where we are now. Three years and six months into production. This is sort of you know, uh, the most interesting screenshot I think we have, sort of a person jumping over a sword is pretty cool. Um, uh, but the real money shot is this one. Three years and seven months into it. Fully functioning in interface, uh, you can chat, all the skills are in, the four playable classes are in. Um, the game plays there, our, our own game mode works and functions, and we have y a few players in the game enjoying it. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, it took us three and a half years to just get the game, and it's still a fairly small game to make, but five people doing it, we don't have that procedural terrain, we don't have that cooperative storyline thing but we have a fun PvP game, which is fairly small design-wise, as one, one could say Battlefield or Counter-Strike, which are not big games uh, design-wise, but they have a bit of a higher production value than we can offer. Um, so, one of the lessons in this, and this is something a lot of programmers just hate, and their soul rots away or whatever. Uh, I'm not a programmer, so please don't kill me. Uh, but use an existing engine if you can, please. <laughs> it just, um, we spent so long just building tools, playing animations, getting sounds, everything. So if you can, mod it, mod it, mod it. Uh, we didn't because we thought, you know, there's no engine out there that can do exactly what we want. We're so special, we're unique. Uh, but we could have made it with Unreal. We could have made it with, you know, whatever and it would have helped us. We, we would have been able to focus on gameplay, the fun part, a lot, a lot earlier. Um, and this is part of the, this topic as well. I'd, and this has come up during, I think, all of the presentations here. Identify your strengths. Um, for us, we couldn't really do that massive project. That was, on, that was just you know, raw power, basically, lacking. Um, but if, you, if you're a good script writer, you might want to keep the storyline instead, or whatever. We didn't really have it 
uh, so we focus down on wh what we thought. But give that a think. You know, what can we do? What type of game can we bring? Um, and this is a tricky part in, in, in hobby development. Because um, when you work, you have a full-time job on the, uh, that you're actually li making a living on. And the team will contribute differently, the different members. Some of them sit four or five hours every day just passionate and producing to the game and everything. Um, and others will pitch in a few hours every week. And as, a, as sort of a lead designer or, or leader or on this team, it, it really hurts w when you need something from someone, from a team member, uh, and you can't really say, you know, hurry the F up and, and do this thing, because we, we can't progress without it. The only thing that will come out of it, uh, it, the whining, ranting, or punishing the team member, is that his, his or her motivation will, will just dive, and the, the member will quit, basically, the team. So it's a really tough balance that you as a leader has to live with. And it, it, you know, if two, a week, two hours a week is that what you can do, okay, fine, sweet. Then we know what type of, of tasks we can put on you. Um, so that's really a sucky point, but it's there, it's gonna happen. Um, and this is sort of a part of it as well. Making a game you, want, you don't want to play won't keep you motivated. Because the motivation here isn't money at, 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 at all, because they are very, very far away. You want to make the perfect game. You have the vision in your head and you go, oh, we're making a fantasy action title. What would be the ultimate fantasy action title? And that's the game you want to make. Um, so sort of just get everybody on board. If half of the team want to make one prod product and, and the other half want to make another one, it won't fly. People will grow tired and leave the team. Um, this is also a problem, just getting, <laughs> getting the concept across at all. I mean, like you saw five months down the line, we still didn't have nothing of gameplay. So people didn't really know what was in my head when I thought, oh, we're gonna make a fast-paced, team-based online action game. That can be anything. That can be World of Warcraft. That can be Diablo 2, or that can be Counter-Strike. Uh, in a fantasy setting. Um, so getting everyone to just understand, and Tobias touched on this as well, um, just getting everybody on the same page. Uh, the pacing of the game, the controls of the game, what do we really want to bring out of it? Is it frenzied action? Is it uh, using your mind that a smarter play would defeat another one? Just what is important about the game in getting everyone in there? Um, during the development, and this is a tricky part, um, in the beginning, as your work group is taking form, because um, you have to look to outside people, outside of your two pals that you want to make the game with, um, but when the work room has solidified, um, you get a lot of requests from outside people who honestly want to help you make your game. And they say, hey, okay, I can make characters for you or whatnot, and they really want to help. But the lesson, harsh lesson we've learned is don't bother. Um, you're, you don't have a paycheck to keep deadlines and stuff. You, you rely on their passion for your game to get anything done. So basically you get a mail that says, hey, I really want to help you out. And you go, oh, cool. And you put in a few hours just pitching the game, explaining how it works, and then furthermore, if they're still interested, you have to decide, this is how you make a creature in our game. This is the process, or these are the tools we want to make, and this is the rest of the code. How is it going to work together? It takes a lot of time introducing people to the, to the project, and most of the time, you don't ha hear anything. You check up on them, and you say, oh, how's it going? Ah, I've done a little, you know, taken form. Um, but usually, you don't get anything. So this is sort of a boring thing, but still, you run across it. Um, and this is, with, without, uh, I'm sort of hopping between topics because, because I'm trying to compress uh, six years of work into, you know, what have we learned in three slides. Um, but without a previous experience, uh, documented game development experience, you won't get a publishing deal. And that's something that we said, I, 
I'm bet willing to bet that half of you sit there, yeah, right, I bet I can do it. It's hard, but we can do it. Uh, and I said the same thing when I got the advice, but you can't do it. It's fucked. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, but during that game, uh, the process of making this game, we went out. We went out fishing. We went out fishing when we had a high concept and we saw, thought, you know, this is going to be cool, procedural terrain, blah, 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 blah. And publishers instantly saw uh, this isn't going to fly. We went out uh, when we had a little beta, uh, or not beta yet, a uh, little demo was taken form and we were looking, is, can we get a publishing deal? Can we get it? No, you can't get it. And then we started asking a crucial question. If we make this fully feature complete demo with everything, procedural train, everything is in there, will we get a publishing deal? No. And that's just nuts to, to us at that point. But you won't, because it's still months and months of production and the publisher sits there with all the money and go, okay, what's their you know, survival rate at this point? Well, they're most likely gonna die. Um, so still, when we were went into beta, um, we, we still couldn't get any real interest uh, in the game. It was sort of a change in, in the conversation, though. People going, mm, it looks pretty interesting, sort of what Tobias said, yeah, or you won perhaps earlier, that, you know, it, we're definitely interested thing going. Um, it wasn't like they were throwing millions of dollars in our laps and we were s sitting there having trouble catching it all. Uh, but when we entered, you know, the final stages right now, we get a sort of, you know, the shady type mails that says, you know, name mine is Emmanuel. Publishing Spain have you got? Uh, and you go, what the hell is going on here? Uh, and that's when you start to get interest of the people that, you know, think, okay, you're an easy target. We can just see if we can get anything from you. Uh, when we're finishing up now, getting close to release, um, we're starting to get a little bit more serious um, uh, requests and, and questions about the game and the project and, and us. But the question we're asking ourselves uh, at this point is, we've done all the work, we put in years of work into this product, product, and at this point, do we need a publisher? It's a small game, we can distribute it via the internet without, you know, especially high uh, bandwidth costs. Um, I mean, a publisher can add a lot of things, like, uh, you know, marketing muscle, uh, if you want to put it into a box, uh, that's the only way you can get it, basically, through a publisher. But, as a small team, we were looking at the math and just going, do we really have to sell 500,000 accounts or, or copies of this game, or a million or whatnot? No, we don't. We have to sell a few thousand. Can we do it ourselves? And that's what we're betting on. Ask me again in a year and see how it goes. Um, but that's what we're shooting for. We believe we don't need a publisher when we've gotten this far ourselves. Um, a thing that has helped us a lot um, while steering away from that gargantuan project um, was to use the flexibility of a small group. You could turn the chair around and ask the guys, hmm, what do you think of this? Uh, and a couple of times, we've made 90 degree turns and we've said, this is wrong. We're going the wrong way. We're not going to be able to do this. And we've done this a couple of times. Like I said, we cut features for two years. Uh, so basically, we sat down now and then and go went, oh, shit, these tools won't be possible to create for us. We have one programmer doing this. We've written the entire engine and all the tools ourselves. One programmer. Uh, so use the flexibility, because Electronic Arts can't turn like we can. That's partly why they're so afraid to give you a publishing deal. Because if they're wrong, they can't just make a 90 degree turn. They have lost a lot of money. But you as a little, little developer group, you can go, okay, if we scrap that feature and add more to this feature, more depth to it, can we create a fun game that's not uh, that taxing to develop? And just thinking smart. What can we do with as little resources as possible on every little design feature in the game? So that's a really powerful one. It has its downsides as well, because um, you can get blinded by all the possibilities. Oh, we can turn right here, or we can add this and this and this. Uh, or we can do this and this, or wait, add this. Uh, and 
doing a few of these things, uh, I can take shadow rendering for an example, just a small little thing in the game, but we went through every shadow rendering technique known to man. You know what type we have in the game right now? None. We don't have shadows in the game. Uh, that's because we want the perfect shadows. They're supposed to support alpha uh, opacity changes and you know a lot of stuff. Um, and we haven't found it yet. We're sort of looking at stuff right now, but you know the the, the project is four years old and we still haven't found the right shadows. Careful of the loopholes. You know you you really want perfection at all times and that do doesn't really work. Um, uh, but dare to think big, because uh, it's wh what keeps you motivated. You know, we we, sp we wouldn't have started out I if we said, you know, we want to make, uh, for us at least, an, an uninspired mobile game. We wanted to make that big action fantasy thing, uh, but we had to cut features along the way. Uh, so, I mean, just dare to throw those ideas out there, because they might be one of those 90 degrees turns, like for us. Um, so, so try them out, uh, and you know, just discuss them. But don't be afraid to kill them if they don't work. Um, when we went out fishing, everyone told us we would fail. You can't do it; it's impossible. You can't create a game in the garage anymore. Uh, that sort of way, it's not 96 anymore, like we've heard here a couple of times. Well, it sort of still is if you have the dedication and, and just the stamina for it, because uh, that's what it takes. It doesn't really take an enormous amount of talent or, or anything like that. It takes focus and dedication and heart uh, and a fair bit, bit of stubbornness. Um, but everyone, when you go out and you say, can we get money for this? No, you will fail, you will die. Can we get, m you know, just anything? If we get this, so no, you're a hobby group, it won't work. But don't buy it. <laughs> Believe in your project and believe in your own ability. That's everything, like I said, dedication, and you know, just love this stuff, and love what you do, make the game you wanna play, and balance that toward, like the decision we made with the space sim, um, can this sell at all? Um, but chances are, even though people tell you this, you know, making the game you want, want to play won't necessarily sell it. As a small group, you don't have to sell a lot of copies. So you can still make a fairly small niche game that just a few people on the globe will enjoy. And can you provide it you know, on the web and just make it instantly accessible? You can sell those copies you need and make exactly the game that you want. But naturally with caution, you know, you may have weird taste or whatever. And this is probably the most cliche thing we've learned during these six years, it is a lot of fun. Game development is the ultimate creative process. You create everything from doormats to epic landscapes. You create one line of dialogue that says, yes, sir, and you can create languages and cultures. It's an amazing medium, and it's just, it's so fun. Uh, it's so much fun. Uh, it's taxing like nothing I've ever been through before. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Now uh, comes the little plug section of uh, this presentation, because I will tell you a little bit about Dawnspire, partially because, you know, what happened to the project, uh, what type of product is it today, and partially because I want to tell you and I want to, you know, let more people know about the game and play it. Um, Dawnspire Prelude, as we've called it, because we still don't want to get, you know, give away that ambitious project, so this is just a prelude. Um, is a team-based online action game with RPG elements. And we have a unique fantasy world, which we don't really use yet, but it, it, it allows us to interpret orcs, elves, dwarves, and add new races and creatures as we see fit. That's a really nice thing to have. And, and back in the ambitious epic part of this, uh, we started writing languages. A few months ago, I, I could have spoken to you in Orcish. Uh, I've forgotten most of it, but you know, it's there. It's, it's bubbling under the hood. And we hope to bring up more of it as we go along. We have four or, uh, player classes, uh, fifth on the way. Um, we try to steer clear of the real archetypes, the, the wizard fireball person that only can thro throw fireballs. 
uh, and the cleric can only heal, and try to bring out hybrid classes uh, that can sort of combine stuff. Um, we have uh, a w the orcish witch um, who can, uh, she's part shaman, part necromancer, part something else. Um, and it, it's really fun to play with because it gives you, you know, just the opportunity to see and wha what's missing in the game design, on the flow of the gameplay. All right, this sort of character would be really sweet to have because this would be a countermeasure to that and that. Um, and it, it's fun to play with that and steer away from the archetypes. And hopefully gives more interesting gameplay as well. A thriving community. A little buzzword thing going on here. I'm trying to build a hype. I hope you can feel it. Uh, we have most of the community tools in place. Um, we have, you know, the forums, private messages, uh, guilds, uh, etc. Um, we're trying to build on these as well because we want, uh, like I said, I, I, I'm, I come from an internet development background um, and we try to use that strength because the programmer also does. So we have an I a AX based website, you know, all the bells and whistles and stuff. Um, so we, we try to give the community all the tools they need instead of guilds having their own web page with everything, calendars and guild fights and such, we try to give them the tools uh, in order to do everything on our website. Um, c you can create characters there uh, when sometime in the future we add a real item system, you're gonna be able to you know, bu purchase items via your mobi mobile or at work. Um, a little thing, but still worth mentioning, we don't have character levels. Uh, we sort of have skill levels instead, because we sort of hate that ding feature where you have to wait a week or so to gain that level 40. Uh, so you can level up a lot faster. And we s sort of try to take the, tre the treadmill out of it. We still have a bit, but it's minimized. Um, two challenging game modes. One of them is team deathmatch, classic. Just fun, easy gameplay to get people into the game and get what it's all about. Because uh, it's team-based action, like Counter-Strike or such. And then our other uh, game mode, which is called Relic Conquest, uh, which is sort of a weird take on domination and capture the flag. You're supposed to bring three relics that are out on the map to your home base and not let the enemy take yours. Uh, and each of the relic has uh, different properties that m requires you to use different tactics in order to get it ho to your home base. We have one that sets you and everybody no near you on fire. Uh, bad thing to pick up if you don't have a healer nearby, you know. Um, we have a soundtrack with live orchestral instruments, courtesy of our sound guy who plays the cello and uh, a lot of other stuff. Um, and the game continues to evolve. And this is really crucial for us as a small team. We're gonna release a core product and then offer additional updates, like the fifth class. It won't be out there to r till release but we're gonna add it as a free update later, uh, as soon as we can, rather, uh, to the game. Uh, well, I thought I'd show you a little gameplay video as, uh, uh, as well. Um, so you can see what sort of, let me see here. Uh, there we go. So you can see what the hell did we turn out with um, from all these years. Um, and it's just a short, thing I captured with our uh, beta testers before um, I went over here. Um, and um, it's a bit chaotic, the gameplay, uh, when you see it for the first time and dive right into it. I don't know if we have any sound, really. Um, but basically, you have eight players on each team uh, and just duking it out. I'm playing sort of a defensive, uh, purely defensively spec character. This character can be molded into either uh, a defensive guy who shields and aids uh, allies with heals and such, or he can be the most powerful offensive class in the game, using his magical sword, bashing people and stuff like that. Um, so this is just a short gameplay. Um, and uh, it's actually turning out to be really fun, rewarding, and it's fun to see when a new tester joins the game uh, and you can see how their skill level as a player uh, increases and you can see that this, skill, uh, that this game really takes player skill uh, as well as just you know, the treadmill thing of, of MMOs and stuff like that. So that's a little peak of the game that has taken four years almost. Uh, 
and we're closing up, sort of, we're getting ready to release it uh, within a month or so, uh, and we just pray to God that uh, this is going to work out, that we have made the right choices along the way, and like I said, uh, if I come back a year later, I can tell you about our choices, not going with the publisher and stuff like that, and see how it applies. So that's it for me. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers of Assembly, because uh, this is something that I've never been to before, and it's just been a tremendous experience. Um, you can visit www.silent-grove.com for more information on the studio and our projects. Uh, and you can visit dawnspire.com slash assembly to create a beta account if you want to try out the game. Um, we always welcome new testers and we would be great to have your feedback. I know that, you know, this is the perfect target audience. If I could go in there and just put our game on every screen there, I would cry of happiness. But, you know, I'll settle with you guys. Spread the word, sort of. Um, that's it for me. Thank you for your time. I hope I've given you some pieces of advice. Hmm? Yeah, it is. Um, especially since it's such a different pacing on it. Um, so you can sit there and be really frantically working with particles effect. You, you saw a lot of things splatting around there, you know, magical effects going left and right. Uh, and you're sitting there and you can create two or three particle effects per day and just sitting there and just working your ass off. Uh, and then the next day, you go, oh shit, we gotta get the game out to the public. Um, let's do some press releases and stuff. And you can sit there for the whole day writing one mail because it's such a crucial mail. And the difference, change in pacing and priori you know, priority of the different tasks is really difficult. Um, and it, it, it's, like I said earlier, wi with a small team, you really have to help each other out. Um, so, you know, our sound guy is helping me a lot with, you know, just coming to events such as this. He's going down to Leipzig uh, with, within a few weeks as a student helper uh, and just trying, you know, to get a feel for the market network and see what we can bring uh, and just help each other out and try to solve issues such as this. You, you had further questions? Um, th does everybody hear the question? Sorry. Uh, the question was regarding the commitment, if it's uh, hard uh, wh when people contribute to the project uh, on a, you know, different scale uh, and, and whether, you know, how you deal with it. And I, I don't have any real, really good advice there. The only thing I can tell you is um, that, you know, pushing them uh, and yelling at them won't help. That's one. Um, and the other one, regarding rewarding people who, who contribute uh, a lot, I don't really know how that would be done. I can't really give them a Christmas bonus because we don't have any money in, the, in, the, in development yet, uh, aside from you know, what we've taken from our own pockets during these years. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I think it's one of those facts as a hobby developer that you simply have to live with. Sorry, what was uh, a what game? Mm, all right. Yeah. Uh, those features. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, um, it's we don't advertise um, 
features we don't have. Uh, we advertise that as a feature we have, uh, that we don't force the player into waiting to level up. Uh, you still have to wait to get, you, you use your experience points uh, in order to buy skill levels. Uh, so technically we still have that level up thing going on the treadmill, but it's uh, at, a, at a much faster pace. Uh, you, you can play one round of the game and then you can see, oh, what skills can I level up? Two levels there, one level there, and your character, character grows in strength. Um, so we, we try to spin that uh, angle on it. Um, regarding marketing, uh, we're and advertising um, in general, um, we try to find the sort of compromises we can. Where can we put in 500 crowns and get something out of it? Uh, instead of, I mean, I get envious every time I see that World of Warcraft ad with the full cinematic thing. It's like six million players, one epic world, free trial, try it out. And I would love to say that, you know, have that sort of advertising material and that those resources, but we don't. So what, what we do uh, is we're gonna you know, use Google AdWords. Uh, we're gonna attend, uh, as long as we get invited to, to speak at seminars such as this, we're gonna take the chance and just get our voice heard uh, and hopefully garner enough interest to you know, reach our goals. Uh, any more questions? Yeah? So, sorry, yeah. Uh, the, the game is going to be a purchasable uh, download. Um, so we're going to distribute it uh, basically on the web um, via the, the, the actual game client is free. Um, it's the account you buy, basically. Because uh, we know that a bunch of five guys uh, working at a game, we won't really protect it against piracy. And we don't really want to in that way as well. Um, I mean, you can play the, the game for free. Uh, it's sort of a, the shareware method of it. Just get it out there everywhere. Uh, we're gonna have it on the Pirate Bay as a torrent. You know, everywhere we can get the client. Uh, but we have a master server, uh, which you have to have access to. Uh, and when the demo, uh, we're gonna have a demo account so everybody can try it out and then have to, you know, purchase it to get the full game. Um, so. And that's how, how we would solve that issue. Any more questions? Well, uh, the question was if we, when people are from outside ask if we can help. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, if we have to take them on as a full team member, or just you know give them basically one thing to conclude, one task, and that's pretty much how we've started it out. Uh, in the beginning, we were like, "Welcome to the family, get in." Um, but we real realized that very few of them actually bring something to the table. So uh, eventually, we started kicking some people. You know, okay, you haven't done anything. Uh, so we started to remove them from the project spaces uh, and and um, we, we started giving single tasks to people who wanted to help uh, and eventually we found out that that's not working either so right now we have this sort of standard mail I, and, and you know just type up I, I can recite it at, at, if you woke me up in the middle of the night and it's like no sorry we would love to but we don't have any money to give you as a salary and we found out that it really doesn't work we try to, to answer manually on every level because that's how we have to do it as a small developer. We have to have that personal touch, but we say thank you, really, but no thank you. Yeah, definitely. And we try to have that as well with our testers and everything. We have about uh, 300 active beta testers now in the game, and which have all basically just invited friends along and we posted a little information on various sites and sort of trickling in, um, and we try to keep just a personal relationship to as many as we can uh, in order to just make them feel at home in the community. Because the community, uh, in addition to the marketing advertising question before, uh, the community is really where we can survive. Uh, if we have a positive community that welcomes new people and actively invites new people to play the game, um, then we're going to make it. 
if we have a, a, com a community, you know, WTF noob, every time a new player comes in, it, we're gonna die. So we we gotta have that personal touch. That's what we think anyway. That's our approach to it. Anything else? Okay. Once again, then, um, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you've had a great, great time as I have had, uh, even though I really miss not having my computer here. I would love to be just on the floor down there, and I'm probably going to be next year. Uh, so thank you for your time, and I hope I you know, gave you something to remember anyway. Thank you. <laughs>